it is my great honor to be with Mr. Dick Bryant here this afternoon. Um, for those of you who don't know, he's a pivotal individual in our hobby in that he was the, shall we say, inventor, publisher, editor, chief cook and bottle washer, I believe, <laughs> of The Courier, which was basically America's only historical wargaming magazine. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction. Back in the day, I discovered the hobby late in life. Uh, I was 32 and uh, mostly a board gamer and diplomacy player. And uh, a fellow by the name of Bob Beatty, who lives in Michigan now and uh, was in vis uh, visiting a scholar at MIT, Bob and I decided we should form a wargaming group. We called ourselves the New England Wargamers Association. Uh, there were two of us. And we decided on starting a newsletter for the magazine. It was first Mimeo, if anybody remembers what mm -hmm. Mimeo. Then we went into a, uh, a six by eight version. That went on for about 10 years. And what it did is it supported the club. There were no dues in the club. What the club would do is every month, we'd all get together one game night, and it was just putting the magazine together and, and mailing it out. And some of the guys would get tired. And in fact, I, I had one customer write in saying, he got a whole magazine just covers. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> and uh, things like that. But uh, we were doing well. And then finally, uh, I found out that I'm sitting here typing at the gaming table while everybody was playing a game. I said, there's something wrong with this picture. So we decided to close it down at that point. And uh, for about a year, there was no curtain. Joe Maselli approached me at uh, a convention up in uh, Michigan. Uh, I think it was a Gen Con convention. And uh, said, you know, he, he was in the uh, advertisement business and he could be, make this into a real full color, nice magazine and would I like to start it again. So we went into full color after that and that lasted for, well, 2009. And we, we went all, all around the world. It, uh, it helped spread the news of the hobby. England pretty much knew what the hobby was about, but here in the United States there were a lot of people who were actually gaming with miniatures one way or another, you know, even just throwing pennies at them and stuff, who never realized all this, this was capable, you know, there was rules and things like that. And all those people started coming into the hobby. To build the hobby back then, we were putting flyers and board games at, at the hobby stores and things like that throwing small demonstrations. There was only about 18 of us in the club, but we were always trying to spread the, spread the word and through the magazine. 1981 comes along, and this, Gen Con would hold a vote, or best of everything for the year, best new figure, best medieval figure, best terrain, best build. And they chose for the best historical miniature, new miniature, historical miniature, a cardboard counter from Frank uh, Chadwick's new game. And it was a, a long counter. It was, you know, like a base for figures. And the idea was to learn how to play the rule with that. Then when you get the figures, you glue the figures in place, and now you get miniatures, and then you can keep going from there. That was was a, that his System 7 Napoleon? Yeah, System 7 Napoleon. I remember those. I had several sets of those. And that was a great idea. But picking the cardboard counter as the best historical miniature when there were several companies in the running, I thought was beyond the pale. Yeah. So I, I started a, a movement sort of in the Courier that, you know, let's all get together, let's do something about this. Uh, Wally Simon, who, was, who wrote articles for me, who, uh, Wally's basement, yep. uh, suggested that uh, we should get together and talk about this. So we set up a meeting in Wally's house Wally had just had marital problems, so was living in a small place, and the basement was the only spot we could all meet outside of Washington, so that's Wally's basement. That's where we met. And we found a group called, uh, well, it was called something else first, but we voted HMGS as the, uh, as the start. Of it. And that, it was the whole idea then. We had some grandiose ideas, like, for instance, 
setting a uh, standard for scales. Can you imagine trying to do that? <laughs> and uh, I wish that would have worked out. Oh, I, uh, I agree. <laughs> and uh, and and things like that. And uh, oh, the other thing we're going to do is we, were, if we if we put on a convention, we're not going to have any dealers there. It's just going to be gaming. That's all. <laughs> you know? But that all changed. I think everybody watching this, everybody who does historical miniature gaming, um, owes you and the other members a, a debt of gratitude because this has been, you know, this has been a passion for so many people now. Oh yeah. Um, and for those of you that aren't familiar with the Courier, the Courier was was much different compared to today's gaming right. magazines. Most of today's gaming magazines our house organs for some product or another. And it's lots of illustrations, and I love good colored pictures of nicely painted miniatures, but the courier was just stuffed full of information. And how did you guys, how, how did you come up with a, that steady stream of, I can pack a magazine with no fluff, no filler, basically? Well, what I did is I, I reached out to uh, people I knew and those who I didn't know, who I knew, <coughs> by reputation had experience in certain periods. So every period we played had an editor. And uh, they'd all feed articles in to me. And it was always an overflow, thank God. And uh, um, that's how we filled it. And then somewhere along the line, I forget how long we were playing before we started this. In fact, I think it might have been when we got to the color edition, we started a theme year. And it was, we mostly tried themes of games that not, we didn't do a theme year in Napoleonic, so World War II or something. It would be, back then it would be things like the Seven Years' War, nobody was playing. And uh, I think we did one between, about the war in Paraguay or something. <laughs> and, uh, and the other thing that we did is we had people vote every issue on what they did or didn't like in the last issue. Using that as a guide would help me decide how to swerve things. I remember strategy and tactics used to do something similar. They would have that little poll about what, of course, being strategy and tactics, it was rate everything on a some kind of numerical scale. And I'm sure they had uh, like a random computer somewhere in the basement that they oh, cranked all that yeah. through. We just we just had people write them, do them an order, and how do you feel about the whole issue, and we'd report on it the next the next issue. You know, so people saw what was going on. You've been involved in this since pretty much the origins of historical miniature gaming, or at least organized. Right. And, and those days, I, I'm, a, I'm later into it than you are, but there were there were just dozens and dozens of different rule sets on every period imaginable. And while by today's standards, most of them were you know crudely printed and, and crudely they're edited, still great rules. Oh yeah, and there's. I feel now that we've tended to focus on a couple of periods, a couple of companies, a couple of rule sets um, that apparently sell well, and a lot of good rule sets have kind of gone by the wayside. I think that the newer generations want everything handed to them more or less ready to go. Box. Give me a box. I remember one of the historicals I came to, they first started pay, uh, selling painted figures. He says, that's crazy. Nobody is going to want to buy painted figures. <laughs> that's half the fun of the hobby is painting your own figures. Well, I was certainly wrong on that. A couple of years later, they came out with all this beautiful terrain stuff. That's crazy. <laughs> Nobody's going to want to buy made terrain. I mean, the worst we ever did was buy a model railroad building. Right. You know, that's half the fun of the hobby is making this stuff. Well, I was wrong on that. And then I went to uh, Fredericksburg Convention, and they had a purpose-built tables for gaming, complete with drawers, a place you could put your drinks and everything. It was had an opening of like uh, six by four, and uh, you could cover it over. And they were like six to eight thousand dollars. Oh yeah, they're, and they were selling. <laughs> The guys were starting to say, well, we're going to have to wait three months before we can fill your order. <laughs> now, you mentioned that you were wrong on a couple of trends in the past, mm -hmm. but I'm going to ask anyhow, what do you see as the trends going forward? Mm. 
Now, for those of you in the audience, <laughs> you bet however you want on this. We're just going to do it anyhow. <laughs> well, I, I think the trend is going to be well, with 3D printing. You know, uh, 3D printing is really going to make a, a big change as, as it, the machines get bigger and cheaper. A lot of people are going to have a 3D machine. You buy, you buy the files, and you print what you want. So I think that's a trend. I think the trend is always going to be make it easier and easier uh, so that all the emphasis is on the gaming. And it'll be only us, us, us old bleeps who will uh, uh, you know, stick to the old tried and true. No, I. Of course, you might be able to make a fortune painting one building for somebody. You know? True, <laughs> I. I see that. I I would agree with you that that idea of pre-printed, pre-painted, get it on the table definitely seems to be more and more. And I walking through the dealer hall today, while not a lot of pre-painted stuff, there are tons of army in a box. Mm -hmm. Open this box, assemble and paint these guys, and here's. You know, here's your three regiments for your division, or you know, here's a Roman legion, which I, I don't think that's a bad thing. I really no, don't. No, it isn't. I'm not saying that it is. It's, uh, it's just a trend that's going to go, you know. I mean, I've already, uh, I, I have to say that uh, I've already fallen to the uh, temptation of using uh, printed uh, tanks. We printed some stuff, um, what did Miles print? Some some German assault guns that somebody didn't, nobody made a model of. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, we really need a couple of these for the table. Well, push a button. The hobby has, has definitely changed from, from where it started. Um, there's nothing, nothing came along to take the courier's place, which I kind of found, I've always found that odd. I would, I buy in PDF now, and I would, I, if there's articles I like, I'd print those out. I think uh, having it sent as a PDF and then printing it out yourself is the way it's going to go. I think that's one of the things that is kind of killing off the whole print magazine thing. In that, I, I, I mean, I've done the same thing myself. Having moved a bunch over the years, at some point or another, I'm carrying the same boxes of magazines. I can just take the articles out okay. that I need. PDF just makes more sense. It's it's really no more difficult to use. Just back it up. Well, I I want to thank you. Thank you. A pleasure. I hope everyone has enjoyed this opportunity to uh, talk with Mr. Bryant, learn about the hobby, and I'm sure that we've got uh, more fabulous guests lined up after the commercial break. <laughs> or not, whatever we have going on next. No, nobody will quite uh, reach this level, but... Right, exactly. It goes without saying. I love that numbering system. <laughs> That's the subject for... <laughs> <laughs>